Welcome to Hacker's Reef. Today we're going to be talking about Zoopox. I'm going to teach you how to correctly identify it, as well as a super effective treatment and some common mistakes to avoid. Stick around and let's cure some coral. Welcome back to Hacker's Reef. Now let's get started learning about Zoopox. This is a picture of a frag in my system that I noticed one day when I was inspecting them had some early signs of pox. You can see these little arrows are pointing to a main sign that tells you that you have a case of zoopox. Look for these white dots when the lights are off and the corals closed. Don't confuse zoopox with sand irritation. The pox will usually be deep inside the coral stalk, while the sand usually gets stuck to the exterior of the coral. It'll come loose with a little bit of flow from something like a turkey baster. If you've correctly identified your problem as zoopox, your next question is probably how did this happen? Unfortunately, the actual cause of zoopox is extremely debated in our community. Based on all my years of research, you'll find that you may have gotten this case of zoopox from changing water that wasn't the right temperature and the temperature swing stressed out the coral. Some people report it's a seasonal issue and it happens every year like clockwork to them. Other fan favorites get blamed like stray voltage or maybe using too much carbon or maybe using not enough carbon. Make sure you leave a comment below and tell us what caused zoopox to happen in your system. Well, no matter what caused them, I'm going to show you this treatment regimen that's going to help get your coral on the mend and you'll have healthy colonies in about a week if everything works out. So here's the supplies you're going to need. First, you need to start off with a measuring cup that you'll use to measure out your tank water for the treatment. Just make sure it's fish safe. You can get a whole set of these at the dollar store. Next up, you're going to need something to mix with. I like to use a disposable knife just because it's easy to get in there and uh, move stuff around. And then you need a container that you can use for your actual dipping. This is just like a takeout container I had and cleaned very well. Um, just make sure that there's no soap residue or anything like that. And you're not going to want to use it again for food. You just want something that fits your frags without wasting a lot of water and medicine. And then you're going to need a container you can fill with tank water to uh, rinse off your frags after they've been dipped in the medicine. You don't want to get that residue into your tank when you put them back inside. Now the most important thing you're going to need is your medicine packet. Now we're going to be using API's Furan 2. Now there's tons of recommendations on dosage. What I usually do is I use one packet for two cups of water. In my experience, that gives you a good balance between treatment strength as well as not being almost impossible to mix. The hardest thing about this treatment is just trying to dissolve the medication packet inside the water. If you use a really high concentration, like one packet per cup, you're going to dump it in, stir it around, and you're going to see yellow residue dust everywhere. The way I do it mixes a little bit better, and in my experience, this concentration gives you a pretty good success with one round of treatments. I went ahead and got my tank water. Uh, remember, this is about two cups of water. Now we just need to grab our packet and go ahead and give it a shake. Make sure that all the dust goes on the bottom. It's a fairly fine powder, and you don't want it to go airborne when you cut open the packet. Then once you get that all settled, you just want to grab your scissors and um, cut across the line. Make sure you use some dedicated scissors for this type of job or something that's like cheap from the dollar store. The last thing you want to do is use kitchen scissors and poison yourself or your family. It's always good to limit cross-contamination whenever you can. Now we're just going to go ahead and take off the rest of the tab and then open up the packet. Now it's a fine yellow powder inside. Um, we just want to make sure that we get it all out and we dump it in without going too fast and making it fly everywhere. So once you're sure you got your package ready, just pour it in nice and slow. Um, you're going to see it hits the water and it kind of goes like a salt mix when it goes in. It's really hard to dissolve and we're going to get to that in a minute. But right now we just want to focus on getting everything out of the packet because since we're not doing a super concentrated dosage, we don't want to waste it and let it get stuck in there. So a couple of taps. Don't obsess about getting every single grain out, but uh, most of it will work. And then you can just go ahead and start stirring really easily so you don't splash water around. Now, I'm going to stir pretty much in real time so you get an idea about how much you actually need to stir this to get the job done. Now, to go over another point about the water source, um, some guides will tell you that you want to use fresh salt water mix. I recommend using the water that the Zoas actually just came out of because if you try to use fresh salt mix, 
you're going to quickly figure out that it's almost impossible to match the parameters of fresh salt water to uh, the tank water that your Zoas were currently in. The treatment's going to make them pretty upset already, so you don't really want to add to that by shocking them with different parameter water from what they're used to. If you do have a quarantine tank for your coral or a hospital tank set up, it's always useful to uh, keep them separated in there. But as long as you stick with the water that they came from, you'll be pretty good with the treatment and minimize shock from the parameters. Now back to the fun of mixing this, you'll notice that you don't see a lot of the yellow anymore. That's because it mixes much better with this lower dosage. Um, if you went ahead and you used the one cup per packet, you'll see it's almost like a coating on the bottom. We're still going to get a little bit of that coating with our dosage, but it's going to be much better than if we went with the uh, one cup per packet. The lower dosage also helps if you need to dip something that's larger than small frags. Once you look at how you're going to dip a rock, then you start to think about uh, two packets per cup and then you start to panic because that's a ton of uh, medication. That's why I recommend the lower dosage and you can probably even get away with a little bit less judging by how much I still have unmixed. I don't really find myself treating things bigger than frags. So you can use this dosage as a starting point and then uh, use your judgment if you have to dip something really big. If you do end up dipping like a big rock full of zoas, make sure you leave us a comment so we can hear what you used for your ratio of medicine to water and how the treatment went. Now I apologize if I put you to sleep with this mesmerizing real-time mixing clip. I tried to keep it packed with some good information, but I just want to hammer in that it, mixing this correctly is a very important step in this process that a lot of people get wrong. And that's why you might think your treatment's not effective, but it turns out you just didn't dissolve enough of the medication in the water. Thankfully, I think that should be about it for how much mixing we're going to need to do on this particular treatment. There's always going to be a little medicine residue on the bottom, but um, that's pretty much all you want to do because if you go too far, you're going to end up making the water cold and that's going to shock them. So you just want the middle ground where it's nice and uh, dissolved. Now you see there's a little bit on there still and we mix that a lot. That's why it's important not to beat yourself up about it trying to get it 100% dissolved because that's probably never going to happen. Now you just want to go ahead and put your Zoas inside your solution that we just mixed up. Now mine are in another room, that's why it looks like they're just teleported into the scene. It's best to do the treatment when they're closed up, like when the lights are off, but um, these came from my tank and the lights were on so they were somewhat open, but after a few minutes of the treatment, they'll get the message and close up anyway, or if the pox were irritating them enough, they probably didn't even open up when the lights came on today. There's almost as much debate for soak time as there is for the concentration of the medicine. I like to soak them for 20 minutes. There's a lot of conflicting information about soak time online, but the one thing that a lot of the information had in common was not to exceed 30 minutes. You don't really want to keep them in there for much longer than 20 minutes because your water is going to start to cool down and that could shock them when you go to do your rinse or when you put them back in their tank. Now don't panic, I'm not going to uh, do a real time shot of them soaking for 20 minutes or anything like that. But what I do like to do is just grab my mixing utensil and go just go ahead and flow the water around a bit because you can see there's still the sediment even though we mixed it really well. You don't want to go and make giant waves but just agitate the water a little bit. This is going to work the solution over the coral and just get it in there a little bit better. Maybe blow off some of the slime that's on there so it gets more contact with the flesh. Whatever we can do to just give the treatment the best chance of working and curing these pox. The main treatment regimen I use is to go ahead and do this for three days with 24 hours between each treatment. And then after you finish your last treatment, you let them rest for a week. Now you can see it's a little bit of these white dots, kind of tough to see, but those are some pox right there. So hopefully after you finish your treatment regimen, those will go ahead and heal after the week. Now another really important thing to go over is when people jump the gun and go ahead and do a whole treatment when they don't actually have zoopox. The most common mistake people make is taking sand irritation as zoopox. If you have some sand that got blown around from your power head or even some detritus that got lodged in your zoa, it's going to look really similar. But if you do compare what you're looking at to the pictures in the beginning of the video, you will see there are definitely differences between sand irritation and zoopox. One of the main ways to notice the difference is if you see the dots that are like deep inside the stalk of the coral, 
Now we're about finished with our treatment. Now rinsing is gonna be the next thing to do. I'm gonna go ahead and do my rinse off camera because my tank is in the room, but I'll show you the water. Now here we are back with the water. As you can see, it's pretty nasty. There's a bunch of sediment in there and um, we'll go ahead and take a quick look at that. There's also some gunk that came off the coral itself as well as a little bit of undissolved medicine. That's why it's really important to give it a nice shake and rinse it out in your uh, tank water before you put it back in. You really don't want that nasty stuff in there. Now this is the container that we use for the rinse. It's hard to see on camera, but there's like a yellow tinge to it from the medicine. You even got some particles floating around in there. Maybe some pox actually fell off. That's why it's really important to make sure you rinse well. And when I say rinse well, I don't mean anything crazy like trying to scrub them off with a toothbrush. You just put them in there and you swish them around then you're all set to put them back into your tank. There's gonna be a little bit of medication still on the coral, but based on my experience, nothing's really gonna happen with that small diluted amount, and that's really all there is to it. Uh, no physically removing the pox, just do the treatment three times in a row with a 24 hour rest period between treatments, and then just have everything rest for a week after you finish your three treatments. Now we're gonna head over to the tank and see what it looks like after they've been put back into the water. You can see that some of them are still really angry and closed up, but some of them are still trying to open. Don't expect them to open right back up like magic. They're gonna to wanna to rest a bit. Some colonies will bounce back faster than others. It's just really important that you give them a little bit of time to recover because you don't want to over treat them and end up shocking them and doing more harm than good. As long as you don't wait the week of rest and then find that you have the pox even worse than you had when you started, you'll probably be fine and you just have to work on patience, which is never easy in this hobby, but it's really a required skill. If you found this video helpful, make sure you give us a like by hitting the thumbs up button below. Make sure you don't miss out on any of our future content by hitting the subscribe button and then the bell icon right next to it. That'll make sure you don't miss out on any helpful videos as soon as they get released. Make sure you leave a comment and tell us how this treatment helped with your Zoopox issues.